thanks, uh, thanks, Grover. If I were a member of Congress, I'd probably still be too afraid of uh, Grover to raise taxes. But Charlie Cook and Richard Harwood are going to tell us um, what's going on in the Congress and the Senate, who's voting, why they're voting, uh, what the liberals, immigrants, old people, young people, and the vegans uh, are going to vote in the next election. Also, uh, Chuck Todd is going to be with us. He's still at the White House uh, being the boy reporter. He will swoop in like Wiley e. Coyote uh, any minute and just slither onto the stage quietly. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Charlie, when I first met you 30 years ago, we were then talking about a Republican lock on the presidency. We knew it was a center-right country. We knew that social issues worked for the Republicans, uh, and we wondered when a Democratic candidate could ever carry California again. Uh, we then went through a period when the, uh, exemplified by Bush-Gore, when we had an even 50-50 split. It appeared in this election, to me, as if we saw revealed that the plates had shifted a little and Democrats were on the high side driven by demography. Uh, are we headed toward a Democratic lock on the White House? What do you see in terms of the balance going forward? That's a great question, John. I, I, you know, I remember back that time when Democrats won the presidency five out of six times, and the phrase we heard a lot was a Republican lock on the Electoral mm -hmm. College. And, and I remember being at a backyard cookout, and somebody, I wish I could remember who the heck said this, was asked the rhetorical question, which do you think will happen first? Democrats will elect a president or Republicans would elect a speaker. And this is about in 1990, 91. And someone said, you know, when one happens, the other will probably follow, which I just thought was really very awesome. Hey, buddy. Um, so I, I think that if Republicans don't fix their problems with minority voters, young voters, moderate voters, and, and uh, young women, moderate and minority, uh, yes, I mean, they've got, if, this, if the Republican Party were a business, you'd say they have an unsustainable business model unless they change this. And so you tell me whether they're going to address these, these challenges. Chuck, we, we started out, uh, I was asking Charlie uh, about how when we started covering Washington together, they talked about a Republican lock on the White House, then we got to even. And now you wonder whether or not Democrats, because of demographic change and the changing role of social issues, cultural issues, whether Democrats are headed toward a lock. Charlie said, uh, not sure, could be. What do you think? Well, when you start with, what is it, 242 electoral votes over five straight elections now? I mean, that's, that's a pretty good baseline to start with, which is what Democrats start with. That's, that's their, their biggest problem, and if you saw to me, what was interesting about Virginia governor is it essentially played out like a federal election. I mean, when you realize that Terry McAuliffe and, and Ken Cuccinelli were essentially rejected by swing voters. They weren't crazy about either one of them. I mean, I, I live in a, um, one of those, there, there actually is a Republican precinct in Arlington County. Um, and, you know, all of my neighbors at the big Halloween party in the gathering, they were all doing the, I don't know what to do, I'm not voting. Like that was the attitude, and these were all people that were, you know, basically that Republican that you hear about um, who says, ah, you know, I don't know how I feel these days about the social issues, this party, I'm not crazy about the Tea Party, they're that, this is the businessman Republican, businesswoman Republican. And, and so that to me, they, they have that, I don't see how they fix that by 2016, and you start looking at these states, and Virginia and Colorado and Florida, let's just take those, if you, if you want to say those are the three closest of the swing states, well, they're all demographically moving away from the Republican Party. So I hesitate to say anything's got a lock on the White House. There's this great book that I remember buying um, right, I was right when I was leaving high school to go to, to go to college, it was written right after the 88 presidential election, which is, it was called The Permanent Minority Party. Uh, it was by it was, Peter Brown. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the book, and it was just, you know, how the Democrats are going to be the permanent minority party. It, they've basically only lost one popular vote presidential election since that book was written, right, in 2004. So, uh, you know, the permanent minority, you know, you, you always hesitate to say it, but this demographic issue, you just can't, you can't overlook it. Well, Charlie, let me ask you about that demographics, because, you know, the message of Peter's book 
was that Democrats had been so enthralled to the interests of marginalized groups, including racial minorities, that they were not able to appeal to mainstream white voters. And what we've seen since then is that the proportion of white voters in the electorate has steadily gone down, went down to 72 percent right. in the last election. What are the implications for our politics going forward of the fact that the Republican nominee got 60 percent of the white vote, the Democratic nominee got 80 percent of the non-white vote? Are we headed toward uh, a kind of racial polarization in voting that is going to create other problems and become self-fulfilling? Well, I've yet to write a book, but my takeaway from Peter's book was never make that definitive a statement <laughs> that will just a book, right? bite you for the rest of your career. But anyway, um, you know, you could slice and dice it demographically, or you could slice it another way. For example, Mitt Romney, if you told me two years ago that Mitt Romney was going to win the independent vote by five percentage points, I would have guessed he won the election. If you had told me that Ken Cuccinelli <clears throat> would win the independent vote by nine percentage points, I would have guessed he would have won the election. But what we're seeing is the gap between Democrats and Republicans has gotten so wide that just winning the independent vote isn't, isn't enough for Republicans. Now, that's partly a function of, 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 of demographics, but part of it is, you know, the gap between, for example, Republicans can win, uh, Romney won the independent vote, but he lost the self-described moderate vote by 15 points. So there's a difference between independents and moderates. So you can look at it demographically, but you can look at it in terms of self-identification of ideology as well. And Republicans are not, you know, they take some solace in knowing that they're 10 percent more conservatives than there are liberals, but forget that they're 40 percent identify themselves as moderates. Chuck, what about the geographic aspect to this? Um, of course, Democrats did just win Virginia, but if you look at the election by geography, Romney wins by nine points in the 11 states of the old Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Obama wins by 10 points everywhere else. So if you're a Republican, how do you figure out how you can break out of that trap, which at one point swung the electorate to the Republicans, right. but now it's become too confining. Well, the problem for the Republican Party is that that was a, they did fall into this trap, and Virginia and Florida have peeled away. They're not part of you know they 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 don't vote like the rest of the South. They're pure swing states, uh, and watch out, Georgia and North Carolina are next, right? And both of them is why it's demographics, and it's not black and white. It's Hispanic, uh, and that's what you know. The look, Georgia is going to be fascinating to watch this coming year um, with, uh, with, with a Senate race and a governor's race that I think is going to be both surprisingly competitive. Partially, though, it goes because the Republican Party candidates are weak. They're just, there's one decent, I think, strong potential Senate candidate in there in Jack Kingston, and that's it. Everybody else will get too tied up, will be easily caricat become caricatures in the way the Democrats have done a good job of this uh, these days. If I were the Republican Party, I would not, I wouldn't be worried about Virginia or Florida or any of these. I'd be just living in the state of Colorado. If you can, so if you think about the problems for the Republican Party with the suburbs and with Hispanics, you know, Colorado, you know, one of the things with Colorado is that you can't explain it away. It used to be, you know, Republicans were explaining away all their problems with, well, Barack Obama just increases the black vote. That all turns out and that's really what's going on. That's not Colorado. There's not a large African American population in Colorado. Um, they're, they're, they should be figuring out how do we, because they've lost multiple Senate races, a governor's race. How, you know, they're going to potentially do some House races there. They've got to figure if they can solve the puzzle in Colorado, then they can solve the puzzle everywhere else. There's, you know, Denver's one massive suburb, right? And they clearly have a suburban problem these days. And I think when you look at the white vote, we want to talk about, you divide it up into two. It's basically your suburban white vote and your ex-urban and, and rural white votes, your upper income white vote versus middle class white vote. Uh, and it's that upper income white vote in the suburbs that the Republicans have a problem with. So I'd be geographically, when I mean, you talk about the differently, if you figure out the Colorado issue, um, everything else will fall into place. But it's also, it would just one short point, but it's also transplants. Virginia, ton of people, non-native Southerners bringing non-Southern attitudes and voting behavior uh, to a lesser extent, but still fairly significant. Like North Todd, in other words. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Don't forget the Welcome Center in Virginia. The great joke is, you have to you have to drive 30 miles. It's in Manassas is when they welcome you to the state of Virginia. Yeah. I-66. 
Arlington County and Fairfax County, no thank you. It's yeah, Bridge William, that's where. <laughs> Virginia's got a ton of transplants. North Carolina, a good bit. Remember the line about the, the suburb of Raleigh, Cary, which stands for Containment Area for Relocated Yankees. And, and, to, <laughs> and to a lesser extent, Georgia, where you know Obama only lost it by eight points. And so to me, those are the three southern states that have had a big influx of outsiders, which I think you could say for Colorado as well. That's right, they're that, a bunch of ex-Californians. Right, it's, a, it's not you know, non-native. Apparently West pot-smoking Californians. That's right. <laughs> and so I think that's, that's, changed, that's changed those three states Charlie, let me ask you, as somebody who knows a lot of politicians very well, about a very practical and structural problem within the Republican Party if you're trying to figure out, from their point of view, how to win elections. How do you bridge the divide between the Hill GOP and the presidential GOP? Because we know about that with redistricting, you've got a lot of members who are very attentive to one constituency and really could care less about the broader national constituency. I, I spoke back in January to the House Republican retreat and sort of the conclusion at the end of the presentation where I went through all the elections. You the one that, who advised them on the shutdown? Uh, no, no. Yeah. They, had, uh, they had me and they had the, uh, the CEO of Domino's Pizza explaining what they did when they found out that consumers thought their pizza sucked <laughs> and how they had to reformulate it. But, um, <laughs> but I walked through the exit poll data, the election results, and then sort of the conclusion at the end was if Republicans are satisfied with the House majority, you don't need to change at all, not a bit. But if you want to win a majority in the Senate, you're going to have to change a lot. And if you want to be competitive in presidential elections, you've got to change a whole lot. And so these members are in these sort of ideological and partisan cul-de-sacs, these very, very protected districts, uh, and that don't look a whole lot like the, 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 the jurisdictions, you know, when you run statewide in most of these places or in competitive presidential elections. So they've got to decide what they want to do. Chuck, um, you and I have been on some conference calls recently with our pollsters, mm -hmm. the NBC Wall Street right. Journal poll, talking about this uh, incredible disaffection of the American people, um, uh, belief that Washington isn't working, uh, which points to a problem for Democrats. They're the party of government. And right now we've got this mess in health care, and I'm wondering how big a political threat, once we get beyond the governance issue and the implementation of the site and the, and the health care law, how big a threat is it to Democrats to be superintending this process that looks to the American people like another government botch? Well, and right, if they can't get this right, then why should we assume that they'll get immigration right? Right, I mean, we basically, the public, it, you, when you look at this anger in the public, they're angry that the Republicans don't want to govern and the Democrats don't know how to govern, right? That that's that's the fundamental flaws of both parties. And I, and I, at some point, I want to get to this this larger issue here, which is, we are in uncharted territory. It is easy to sit here and say, boy, health care is going to be this disaster for the Democratic Party in 2014. Three weeks ago, we said the shutdown was going to be a disaster. For I think both parties are right, you know, and we're going to see things like what we saw in Virginia, which is this sort of Ugh. And so some races and you're, you know, it's going to be, or really, we, we've experienced this in 92, right? 1992, you had a public very angry uh, at a bunch of people bouncing checks, basically angry at the Democrats on Capitol Hill, and then angry at an out-of-touch Republican Party that was running the White House, you know? And so, and what did that lead to us? It gave us a third party. We had incumbents were losing primaries in odd places. Um, it didn't really change the massive balance of power, but it really, but... But boy, it felt like a big change, and we sort of went through, I, I, I think we're still sort of sorting ourselves based on, on what happened in that 92 election. So, um, you know, I think that the, this is the, you know, this is why healthcare has to, it has to be fixed. It has to be implemented well, because this could set back the Democratic Party a generation on it's, being a solution, on, it, on being a governing, being the ability to govern. It sounds, Chuck, like maybe you're feeling a little Mike Bloomberg third party I kind think of action something, in I would be running, 2016. I would be, I'm shocked that we're not seeing more independent candidates. And I know that part of the problem is there's, a, there's no pool, right, of, you know, we don't trust business anymore. I mean, Mike Bloomberg's not the right guy to New York, to Wall Street. You know, too corporate. You know that sort of. You agree with is, that, Charlie? Sort of angry that, that, to be. that if there's a third party, Mike Bloomberg can't be the leader of it. I don't think effectively. It. I don't think a an independent candidate can possibly win a three-way race. I mean, if you think about it, let's say you're Mike Bloomberg. Let's say you're a perfect person in every respect. 
richest person, smartest person, everything. What happens? You run in a three-way race. Presumably, you'd get a plurality of the popular vote, which would translate into a, pop a plurality of the Electoral College vote. The election would then get thrown to the House, uh, where each state gets one vote, and Republicans have, what, 30-odd delegations. It it's a virtual impossibility for an independent to win the presidency. What I wish that Americans elect outfit would do is say, instead of trying to get candidates to run or provide a path for a candidate to run for a job that's impossible for them to win, is encourage independent candidates, people who are reformer CEOs or university presidents, community leaders, to run as independents for the House and for the Senate. Yes. I mean, there is nothing wrong with the Senate that three or four legitimately independent senators wouldn't fix, 15, 20 House members. That could go a long way. But there's a structural barrier on the on the presidential side. There just simply can't be. It, you agree? No, sure no, no, that's it, exactly it, what I, that was sort of. I wonder when trying to finish my thought. That's what I'm shocked at. Where are the 2014 independent candidates? It would be so easy. I look at the my home state of Florida, and I'm watching what's going to go on there. And basically, you have a very unpopular governor versus a, uh, somebody who's a party switcher who I think the public is going to struggle with. Are you? Are you for real this time? And Charlie Crist and Rick Scott. It to me looks like the Virginia governor's race on steroids. Except more money is going to be involved, and it and it and it's one of those where you're going to have, I think, swing voters, literally not sure what a third party candidate of some sort would blow that thing wide open. Or frankly, Charlie Crist, I think, blew it. He shouldn't. It's easier for him to do this through a party. It's all this stuff. He actually might have been a very viable independent candidate, and he may someday regret that he didn't do this as an independent candidacy, but by switching parties, it automatically, you know, I think creates political skepticism. I don't understand why there aren't more independent candidates um, it, it, it doing it, because I, I know both parties are struggling. Nobody wants to run in a political primary anymore. We know what a mess it is, particularly for on the Republican side. You have a lot of good candidates saying no, and the quality of candidate recruits this year has been mediocre at best. Why, you know, I, I'm with Charlie. If if there is this entity out there that cares, go out there and recruit independent candidates because you could, you know, five could do it in the Senate. Five independent candidates could do it and, but, and if they serve in the Senate. But the thing is, if you're a, an accomplished person, someone who's been very, very successful in life in whatever way, running as an independent candidate is like jumping out of a plane and not being really sure that the parachute works. I mean, there's no support mechanism. There's no, I mean, it would take a, an enormous leap of faith and my suspicion, a personal checkbook that could basically pick up the tab for the race. But, you know, heck, we've got plenty of people that do that, that could do that, but I'd love to, I'd love to see that happen. The public wants it. Okay, that's what we know. Self-identification with the two parties, that's what you were talking about in this poll call. Our pollsters have noted raw self-identification with the collective two parties is below 50%, three polls in a row for us. That's people saying, I don't want to be considered a member of either party. Okay, that doesn't mean ideologically they're not liberal or conservative, but they don't like, they're not comfortable with identifying with either party right now because they're kind of embarrassed, right? They, they think that in the, on, the, on that governing front. The, the, the public is screaming for this. They're begging for independent new people to run, and they think the two parties, I think, um, are, not the, are not the place to be. I was talking to a Democratic pollster two weeks ago who said, Voters want to punish Republicans, but they don't want to reward Democrats. And I think that really kind of captures it. I mean, that, that we have these two competing narratives. On the one hand, can, will Republicans fix their problems with their brand and with the young minority women moderates? But on the other hand, aren't we just seeing a classic case of second term fatigue and all the problems that typically happen in second terms, including chickens coming home to roost, which is where I'd put the Affordable Care Act. Chuck, let me ask you about uh, one of the obvious ways for Republicans to deal with their problems. That's the immigration issue. So we know on the one hand they have a huge strategic need to repair their, their issues with Hispanics. On the other hand, we know that House Republicans don't want to go there. Where does that issue go? I, there is, I think there is, to me, this is where you look at where the three House leaders are from, the House Republican leaders. Boehner, Swing State, Ohio. Kanner, Swing State, Virginia. McCarthy, Blue State, California. This is a case where the three leaders know what they have to do. I think they are buying time. Everybody I talk to, they, they, they're they going to, I, I'm an optimist. I think sometime in the spring, after some filing deadlines have passed, after a few, immigration is not the hot button issue. It's how, in a weird way, the more focus on health care, 
it's probably the way the Republicans might be able to. But you think it happens in this Congress? I think it happens in this Congress, and I think you it happens that, sometime this summer. Maybe I'm being naive optimist, but I, the leadership of the Republican Party knows they have to do this. So they just have to find the timing to just do it without totally exploding their their base. Charlie, Chuck, I'm not going to call you naive or an optimist. I'll just say you're crazy. I mean, I, 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 no. I, no, I hear you. I know. I just think they know they have to. So they're trying to find a way. That's why they don't say it's dead. I think that, that what would have to happen is they've got to find some very credible conservatives to go office by office, sitting down one at a time, and just walking these people through the numbers of why the current course for the Republican Party cannot work. And that unless you just want to be have the House forever, this won't work. But the key is, and everybody- and won't they all say, how'd that work out for Marco Rubio? Well, yeah, um, I, that was without, I mean, I think they've got to literally walk them through and get each of them comfortable with it, just sort of walking through, walking through the numbers. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But we know that most members, certainly most Republican members, are a lot more afraid of a primary than they are a general election. And anything that they do that could be described as the big A, amnesty, in any perverted way, will be, will, will, they'll get jammed. Mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, you know, I've never seen a situation where a party had a problem that there wasn't the potential for the same problem on the other side. And, you know, if the budget fight ever got over to entitlements and we started talking right. about change CPI or anything like that, you would see the same fractures, fissures in the Repu that you see now on the Republican side on the Democratic side because the left would go out of their Which minds. Which is why I don't understand in a totally... Um uh, a totally just Machiavellian way why the Republicans haven't taken up the president on chain CPI, just introduced his budget, parts of his budget in part of these budget deals because I, they, they could end up splitting the Democratic Party in a very hostile way. But of course, uh, maybe a lot of those older white uh, Social Security and Medicare well, recipients wouldn't be happy if they did that. Well, that's the other thing, right? Republican. The weird issue now is a lot of us, I think, still view older, we, somehow there's too many people in Washington that still think older voters are FDR voters, right? That they're all these FDR Democrats. This is a base Republican vote now. Seniors are a base Republican vote. And our, our um, way too early poll uh, of Christie and, and Hillary, I'm not, I, if you want to take away one, a reminder, one of the only three groups that Christie led Hillary on was among seniors. This is a rock-ribbed Republican group now. And, and so I think you're right, John. I think Republicans are afraid of, of turning them off because uh, it can uh, quickly happen. I want to go back to 2016 in our way too early poll in a moment. But before I do that, I want to talk about social issues for a second. Because, again, when we started covering politics, social issues were murder for, for Democrats. Democrats. Now they're offensive weapons. And I want you to look at where this is headed and think 10 years in the future, will gay marriage be legal in every state and will marijuana uh, be legal in every state? Wow. Um, let me get, that, get there in directly. You look at surveys of millennial voters, and what you'll see is that they're not like their older siblings or you know, parents or anything, in the sense that they're not anti-government like conservatives, but they're not pro-government like liberals, but they're very, very skeptical of government because their life experience has been the government hasn't functioned well. They've seen dysfunctional Democratic government. They've seen dysfunctional Republican government. So the thing is, for Republicans, if you look at that group and you could say, gee, they, you know, Republicans could have a fair shot at them. But this generation is always also very libertarian. And, and I don't think we need two liberal parties. But if, if Republicans would just figure out. Ted Cruz says we've got two liberal parties. Uh, yeah, turn the volume down. Just, just pull it back a little bit. That, that you know, the pro-life community isn't going to start voting Democratic if Republicans just sort of push it down the priority list and talk about it a lot less. If they would do that, I think they would do a whole lot better. But they can't seem to get themselves to do that. Uh, every state, no, probably not every state. But I've been stunned at how same-sex marriage is caught on. I mean, I've. I've, I've 
never would have dreamed it would have caught on and moved as fast. Think about as 2004. It has. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I never thought. So the thing is, and I think I think that this country is changing faster than we've ever seen it before. And so these things will be in most states now. Whether you know, what do you think, Chuck? Ten years from now? Oh, I think Supreme Court. I think I think it's legal nationally. I think Supreme Court. I mean, they they open the door. They basically almost open the door with 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 prop a it'll it'll i think the next time gay marriage gets to the supreme court they are essentially and it'll get to this whole whole recognition so does the mississippi marriage, legislature will does pass you, it? no because it'll get to federal recognition of it it'll be it'll be more where you can't ban it you know mm -hmm. you can't you get married in one state and then the recognition so it might as well it'll feel as if it's a marijuana i'm not quite sure we get there i think that uh that that is uh, state by state but you know, it's something about the social issue, and it's sort of how the right lost control of the abortion issue, um, because they were winning, right? The country was slowly, thanks to technology, frankly, moving into a quote-unquote more pro-life position. But I asked a pro-life activist, very, and I said, "What would happen if you had a Republican candidate who came in here and say, you know what? I'm for, I'm, I'm so, I'm, 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 I'm pro-life, and I, I don't believe any exceptions." but I'm, I'm for giving away free birth control to everybody. This is how much I care about. I don't want anybody, I don't want, I don't want there to be any unwanted pregnancy, so I'm also for handing out birth control at 15. Would you work against that candidate or for that candidate? And this person said they'd work against him. So it, it, it just tells you that this, somehow the Republicans allowed themselves to get caught in this contraception trap because Democrats don't have to talk about abortion anymore, right? They, have to, they get to talk about basically personal sexual freedoms. And what a way that that is. The Virginia governor's race, Cuccinelli won on the economy, Cuccinelli won on health care, he got crushed on abortion. Abortion was the number three issue. But who won the election? McAuliffe, he won it on social. And abortion is the catch-all, he won it on contraception. Charlie, uh, okay, let's get way too early. Uh, 2016, is Hillary going to run? And if she does run, is it a layup for her to win the nomination? I, I think there's probably a one in three chance that she doesn't. And, 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 you know, this town... So that means yes. Uh, probably. Well, no, the thing is, this city, everybody thinks that every decision is 100% political. When she's going to turn 69 years old two weeks before the election, I'll be the same age Ronald Reagan was when he first got elected. And I'm not talking about this being an issue used against her, but let's face it. I mean, well, I, I was talking to a friend of, of theirs who said, if his and her health is good, she will run. I would sort of modify that, that to say, if his and her health is good and she feels up to it, she will run. But, you know, that last few months, the Secretary of State were pretty tough on her. And she's got to feel like, you know, do I feel up to this? Because certainly running for president is more strenuous than Secretary of State. And if she runs, is she the nominee? I think in all probability. I mean, the way I would look at it in terms of Biden, for example, is for Joe Biden, if Hillary doesn't run, I don't see how he could make himself not run. I mean, I, I think he, he just wouldn't be able to help himself. And, and so even though not running makes a whole lot of sense for Joe Biden, considering he'll be 74, what, two weeks after the election, uh, you know, I, I think it would be an easier decision to make if she, if she runs. But uh, I, I still think there's a one in three chance she does it. But if she does run, you know, you'll see a Martin O'Malley and a Hickenlooper, or maybe a Brian Schweitzer, or maybe Howard Dean. I mean, you'll see some people in. You know, I don't think you'd see Cuomo get, Andrew Cuomo get in. I don't think you'd see another woman if she's in. But, but we've seen the last all-male open field for the Democratic nomination. Chuck, let's talk about the Republican side. Uh, in our poll, uh, Chris Christie got a third of the vote. A third said they'd vote for somebody else, but it was very heavy to the Northeast. So how do you handicap what the Republican field is right now? No, I mean, I think it's, yeah, there's probably, you have your establishment, there's really only two guys that uh, occupy that space, Chris Christie and Jeb Bush, right? That they would be the automatic establishment money. And, and look, I, I'm somebody who thinks that, you know, Jeb is probably, if he, first of all, he is thinking a lot harder about this than people realize. and the. His only shot at the White House is if somebody named Clinton is running on the other side, and I, and he knows that. Right? Do you agree it, with me that it, Jeb it helps has him a better chance of going the distance than Chris Christie? I do. I think he's more disciplined. I think he can straddle the fence and, and unite the party. I mean, it, then you have this sort of the middle ground guys, the second tier who could be strong and would be there if 
if Christie falters and Jeb doesn't run. And that to me is where Scott Walker occupies that space. You know, he's, he's the guy that I would go to Vegas now and put 10 bucks on, because you can probably get him for 20 to one odds. Um, and, you know, I think he would be, I think he's likely to be on the ticket. Beyond By the those way, this three assumes that we just he, he mentioned. Runs. Then there's a Tea Party, then there's, I think, the, the Tea Party, I know everybody's high on Cruz. I feel like, I just assume that he's, he's more on this Palin track where it's like, it's so much, you know, that he, he's just going to burn out, right? There's just so much attention to him where Rand Paul feels like he's more built to last. Beyond the three that we've just talked about, Jeb, Christie, Walker as a long shot. Yeah. Who else could legitimately expect to win the nomination? Because my assumption is that Rand Paul is not in that category. I disagree Ted on Rand Cruz Paul. Ted Cruz is not I, in that category. I think Rand Paul can win the nomination. I think he's got an interesting – look, he's got – his biggest problem is going to be social issues in Iowa. I'll be and, – and, and, you know, people close to him acknowledge that. Is his, you know, the history of his father, the libertarian aspect, that he's not pro-life enough, that he's too much of a states' rights guy. Um, so – He's going to have to navigate tougher waters there, but I think he can, he can potentially do this. Uh, you could see him doing well in New Hampshire. It's got a libertarian streak that people forget about uh, in New Hampshire. Libertarians have, for years, over overperformed there. You can see how he pulls this off. His hardest, the hardest constituency for him is going to be the. Uh, evangelical wing of the party. Do you or, agree or, with that, uh, Charlie? You think Rand Paul could win the nomination? I, th if I had to pick two right now, if I had to go to Vegas and pick two, I'd pick so Scott Walker and Rand Paul. I don't think there's. I think the chances of of Jeb Bush running are under ten percent, and and that I just think that I think he'd be he's intrigued by it. He's be he'd love to be president, but I think there's just some family issues that don't relate to his last name. That that. He, he just sort of, it would be very difficult right. for him to run. But you think Paul could win the nomination? I, I th first of all, I think Ted Cruz has redefined the term extremism in the Republican Party. <laughs> and as it was, and, and I think Rand Paul has been, shown himself the last few months to be a lot more pragmatic, a lot more sophisticated a politician. You talk to Republicans in the Senate, they'll say, mm -hmm. you know, in the Senate conference lunches, he'll sit next to or near Senator McConnell. They cooperate. I mean, I thought it was going to be another Jim Bunning, uh, Mitch Not McConnell. Horrible. Yeah. They get along very, very well. The guy is trying to be a team player. I think he is gradually becoming more acceptable, and Ted Cruz is helping him get there. Yeah. So I would pick, I'd pick Walker what, and, and One last Paul. point. Let me ask you, Chuck, because our time is up. Yeah. Uh, you think he can win the nomination. Do you think that Republicans, donors, voters, everybody, could look at Rand Paul and say, he could win the White House? I don't know. And I think that that's, you know, Paul supporters will tell you, hey, against Hillary Clinton, he can run to her left on foreign policy uh, on some issues that he could overperform with the youth vote. Um, but I, I tell you, I think, that, you know, there's, there's obviously ways you could picture how the Democrats could exploit it. And I think that that's his biggest leap, right, is how does he get the conventional donor? How does he get Ken Langone, uh, the, the, you know, uh, up there, um, uh, who's a big big New York Republican financier, um, the Arthur Blanks of the world down in Atlanta. Can he get that money crowd who are big Jeb Bush and Christie people? Um, could he get them? I don't know. And I think that that, that you know, he, here's what's interesting about him. He's spending a lot of time courting these people. He's trying to answer their skepticism. And so I, I guess that that's why I don't, I, I don't uh, rule him out at all. But by the way, one more dark horse. It depends if he runs. I think we underestimate Mike Pence a little bit. He's, of all the governors we don't talk about, I could picture him, particularly if sort of Christie flames out, Jeb doesn't run, Walker loses his reelection, which is not in, inconceivable. Suddenly Pence could be that other governor um, who's rock ribbed with conservatives. Putting Quickly. personalities aside, I think we don't know what the value of the Republican nomination is going to be in 2016 or the Democratic nomination. We know historically that, you know, five times out of six since the end of World War II, the party that's had the White House for two consecutive terms has lost it. So history ought to argue, argues for Republicans. But on the other hand, if they haven't fixed their brand, if they haven't fixed their problems with some of these specific demographic groups, uh, they, 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 they can't do that. But on the other hand, um, we also know that um, uh, President Obama's numbers are right down there where George W. Bush's were at this point. 
and w there's a lot of fatigue out there. I don't know that voters are going to be open to the possibility of a second Demo of a third Democratic term. So, you know, I, I, to me, I think these same these are the dynamics that are going to drive 2014 and 2016. Count me skeptical on Rand Paul, and please join me in thanking Charlie Cook and Chuck Todd.